and there, there's even some newer things going on with the moon right now since we are just past the anniversary it seems like every website is talking about the moon and of course why haven't we gone back that's the big question that is in everyone's mind yet again as history seems to repeat itself before i get to that i just want to conclude one thing with the f1 engines go ahead there, yeah. there was a serious problem with the f1 engines during testing and it was called combustion chamber instability and they weren't really able to resolve that issue and in fact nasa admitted to a constant percentage rate of failures during the static testing of the f1 engines and when nasa said that they fixed the problem they actually say in the next line that they don't really know what the problem was. And my question is, well, you didn't know what the problem was. How were you able to fix it in the first place? And it's my assertion here that they actually either used the F1 engines or used the substitute to launch the Apollo missions. Something launched that day in 1969, but it was most likely whether it was an empty rocket because the F1 engines did not have the power. And I want to make sure that people understand that, that is the F1 engines did not have the power to launch an Apollo payload into low Earth orbit. And if that's the case, there was no Apollo moon landings because without the F1 engines, you could not have landed hardware on the moon. Yes, and of course, going back to why we haven't gone back to the moon, I'm yeah. very interested in both of your opinions. Randy, go ahead first. That is definitely a valid question. And every time that question is asked, I hear the same thing every time. NASA doesn't have the funding. That's just another in a long line of excuses as to what NASA gives for not being able to go back to the moon. If you listen to some of the astronauts, Don Pettit from one is actually admitted that, and he's, he's on record as saying that you can just look this up anywhere. He's quoted everywhere as saying that we, he would go to the moon in a nanosecond, but we destroyed that technology. And that is exactly what has happened. A lot of the technology and the schematics for the Saturn V rocket for the thousands of rears of telemetry tapes have been destroyed. And they've been destroyed for one reason, to hide the evidence that there was nothing there in the first place. It would show if there was any schematics, there's just no way, it was impossible to get to the moon with that technology. It's impossible to get there now. The reason why they haven't gone back isn't because of lack of funding. They still get $20 billion a year. NASA could actually divert its funds to their manned space program if they actually wanted to. What I find very ironic here and very interesting is, is that NASA can come up with $100 billion on the uh, International Space Station, but they can't spend money on their own means of getting there. They have to rely on Russia to do it for them. And I might add that Russia is using 50-year-old technology. So you have one country 50 years later in the world that's capable of launch to low Earth orbit, and that's with Russia using a rocket using 50-year-old technology. There's something seriously wrong with the mass space program today. And Scott, go ahead if you have anything to tag there. Well, if you realize that NASA actually hasn't launched anything since 2011, I would think they're out of business. Yeah. They don't have anything in the works. I look through their report server all the time. Most of the documents that you find in there, they're working with Boeing researching for jet engines for aircraft for supersonic flight that's one of their main focuses that they're working on they're doing the testing for boeing and everything else on that and the only other technology that they've really come up with is actually quite an enhancement with aluminum products they're working with brp that make evinrude engines and you'll find that technology in the new evinrude outboard engines that's one of the few things that they've actually come up with that, that actually work. The, the, the engines are quite reliable, much lighter and more powerful and burn even cleaner than a modern car does. So that's one of the few things they've come up with. As far as going to space or having a space program, they've basically been out of business for nine years. My goodness. Yes, it's very unusual that we have not gone back and you would have to imagine that it should be such an easy task with current technology, right? Well, you know, think about it. I ask people to think about it, it, it this way. Getting a rocket off planet Earth requires an enormous amount of resources because of the gravity forces involved. So why wouldn't they have had a moon base by now to launch from there? I mean, the, if they had invested the money 50 years ago, to expand on and build on the technology that they had back at that time, 
they would have had launch capability from the moon. It would have been a lot far easier if the cost would have more than paid for itself by now. And launching to planets like Mars and so on and so forth would have been a lot easier in terms of launching payloads. But no, they haven't done that. It's gone backwards. It's gone absolutely backwards. As Marcus Allen said in the HBO video, he said, it's like Wilbur Wright flying his first airplane in 1903, and then we did nothing after that. Uh, it just stopped. And that's exactly what happened 50 years ago. They're telling us the end to the moon and back. We had this wonderful technology and now we, we've lost it. We've destroyed it. We can't go back. And we have one country, one rocket, and that's it. Ridiculous. They keep, they also, they, they also keep feeding us dates. Uh, they keep feeding dates to the public only to delay and push back uh, all these alleged far out trips to the moon, to Mars, you name it. Oh, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I actually can write a comedy routine on this. I mean, you take NASA, let's just take the Apollo missions, for example. In the 1970s, they said, we're going to go back to the moon in the 1980s. When the 1980s came along, they said, no, 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 actually, we're going to go to, we're going to push this back. We're going to send a crew. We're going to land a man and move back in the 1990s. And they said, okay, the 1990s came back. And they said, no, by the year 2000. And now they said, why the year 2020? So now we're closer to 2020. They said, well, actually, no, we're not going to go to the moon. We're going to go to Mars. And then he said, we're going to do that in 10 years. And then he said, no, no, actually, we're not going to do Mars in 10 years. We're going to do it in 15. And then they changed that and said, well, we'll do it in 25. The narrative is the same every decade. And I mean, you know, you can really write a comedy sketch on this. I mean, it's just, it's just amusing how I, I really think they think people are stupid. People are not that stupid. They know. They know that we're not going back. And it's just a narrative that NASA has, as you say, every decade to keep people's interest up. So That's strange. It it's very strange. They say space is the final frontier, but have we actually explored it? Yeah, very interesting. The final frontier. Yeah. And, you know, no, I mean, it's hard to say. We have unmanned missions and some of them have been successful, at least as far as I know. I haven't looked into that aspect of it. But I know what they're on, which is very interesting that you uh, brought that up because their yeah. unmanned missions during the 1960s was plagued with problems. I mean, I've been researching this for the next book and their unmanned missions had problems after problems after problems leading up to the Apollo missions. But you, you, lo and behold, the Apollo missions, which were more complicated in terms of its technology, all worked seemingly perfectly, except for Apollo 13, which people always throw at me and say, well, what about Apollo 13? Apollo 13 was a success. Okay, because even though it didn't land on the moon, they miraculously made it back to Earth and it was called a success. So we're looking at a 100% success rate in terms of their trips to the moon and back. I'm not talking about the Apollo 1 disaster because people say that one too. Just in terms of their missions in space, they have a 100% success rate versus their on-man program, which was dismal. And anybody can look at this for themselves and see the same thing. It's very interesting. My question was to NASA, well, if you're not sure of the energy flux and you don't have the equipment to measure the true energy flux out there, how is it that you were able to design shielding to protect the astronauts? And that was the question that has never been answered. They don't really know the energy flux of the Allen belts. And remember, this is constantly changing every second. You need real-time information before you send any manned missions through these belts, which they didn't have the capability of doing back then, and they still don't have it today. And if you don't know the true energy flux, how can you build shielding to protect the astronauts? And that was the biggest thing for me. There are many elements in space that can end a mission in seconds. Uh, you know, obviously solar particle events, coronal mass ejections, galactic cosmic rays, those are three of the biggest things that can end a mission in a matter of seconds. And to give some people an idea, these ejections, mass plasma from the sun, can be many miles in diameter. We're talking tens of thousands of miles. But for example, coronal mass ejections have the kinetic energy to boil the North Atlantic Ocean. You get caught in that, you're dead. There is no amount of shielding that we have or capable of today will protect any astronaut from, from a solar storm of that nature. So that was one aspect that I looked into. And it's very interesting to let the listeners know that the Apollo missions were sent up supposedly at the height of solo flare activity. So they were dodging solar flares to and from the moon. There was a massive solar flare event that happened August 4th, 1972, just about four months before the last Apollo mission of Apollo 17. And this solar flare was so powerful, it startled even NASA. 
it was recorded as the largest, most powerful solar event of the 20th century at that time. And it took NASA by surprise. And yet they sent up, or they claimed that they sent up the last mission, Apollo 17, four months after that mission, after that solar flare. And it makes you wonder why, why would they even risk sending a manned mission four months later after such a massive flare like that? I mean, and there's a lot of questions that NASA has never answered. Yeah, that's pretty careless to do that. You would imagine. Yes. <laughs> you would imagine. Yeah. Dead heroes are not good to us. We need them back alive. Yeah, I'm and, with you on that one. You know, yeah. Good exactly. Lord. And uh, of course, the, the first red flag for everyone, having just the primary red flag that everyone should have picked up on was the simple fact that NASA lost the footage. Yes. And that's a very utter interesting point. Now, I actually go into this in great detail, and I'll give a few things here for the listener, sure. and I hope that they will look into this themselves. All of this was supposed to be recorded on reels of telemetry tapes. Now, we're talking about 1960s computers, so these reels would be about the size of your steering wheel. And to give you an example in your car, steering wheel in your car, so to give you an example, for Apollo 11, there was an estimated 14,000 reels of tape recorded. And each reel of tape contained three pieces of information. Number one was the biomedical information of the astronauts. Number two was telemetry from the spaceship systems. And number three was the live video feed from the moon. That has been lost, all of them. And then subsequently I found out that not just Apollo 11, all of the telemetry tapes for all of the missions, an estimated 140,000 reels of telemetry tapes have gone missing. And then I found out that they weren't just missing, they were destroyed. And that is documented in my book and the reader can read that and they'll see for themselves exactly how I walk everybody through it and the finger points right back at NASA. And it can only be one reason why all this telemetry information was destroyed, because it didn't exist. It just didn't exist. So if you have these telemetry tapes uh, looked at by historians and they see there's just nothing on these tapes, then you're saying to yourself, whoa, wait a minute, what's happening here? So better than to have that happen, destroy the evidence because there was no evidence. Yes, the original tapes now magically and physically disappeared. Uh, yeah. That's really gold, ladies and gentlemen. I, I can't buy that. Yeah. And I've actually gotten into some discussions with proponents of the missions. They try to justify that these tapes were taped over. And as Marcus Allen said, but what? I love Lucy comedy shows. Why would you tape over the greatest event in the 20th century? I mean, it makes no sense. And if anybody, you know, we have common sense out there. One of the most important aspects of any event, major event in history, is keeping very detailed records of that event. And that applies to the Apollo missions. I can't think of anything else that would have been a greater event than that. And it's yet they destroyed all that evidence. That is the key evidence. Historians have actually said themselves that if they find these tapes, it would be a treasure trove of information for them. That means that they're significant. They're gone. They're not they're not they're non existent. Yep, and, and really, that's the most troubling aspect of all. It really makes you wonder. Yeah. And Scott, how do you feel about that as well? Well the fact that they're never Ridiculous. going to be able to repeat it means that they have to stay lost. Not that they ever existed, right? Exactly. Because if, if somebody actually does manage to get to the moon, that telemetry would be compared against what the Apollo missions were, right? And there's no way they're going to be able to create those now because they have no idea what the uh, information would be. They keep changing the information and updating their information all the time on all of the data from the Apollo missions. They changed little things or they changed great things to make it work, right? It's kind of a debunking thing that they have going on, trying to, when somebody comes up with something, they, they come up with a little video or they come up with a PDF file. Looks old, is dated old, but the information has changed. And fortunately, I have most of the PDF documents down before they've changed them. And when I see that, they're no longer in the archive in the original spot. It'll come up, show me a 404 error. I just search for that same document again, and I come up with the new updated one, and then I compare them. 
and anything that they are paying attention to that they're changing in the documents mean that there's actually a problem with that area of the piece of equipment or data or anything else that they're trying to cover up. There's something too that I would like to add to that Go ahead. The, in terms of the telemetry tapes. Often it's asked that if the Apollo missions were fake, then how come the most obvious country in the world, Soviet Union at that time, didn't say anything about that? And I'm going to be talking about that more in my second book. I do mention it briefly in the first one. But there's another aspect of this that people need to ask themselves. The, the Russians, right now, the Russians and the Americans are pals when it comes to their space program. I mean, they're working together on the International Space Station, so they're cooperating. They're just like friends, okay, for lack of a better way of putting it. So if the Soviet Union at that time was tracking the Apollo missions, first of all, they knew it was a hoax, and they, and, and they didn't reveal it for their own reasons, and, and, and there's many. But if they were tracking these missions, then they would have their own telemetry tapes. And they know full well that NASA claims they lost theirs, so why don't they hand theirs over? And that's a question that proponents can never answer. They don't have them because they weren't tracking them because there was nothing to track in the first place. It's a great question, by the way. If you look at the, the videos or even the photographs and you see the behavior of the astronauts as they're moving around, they don't seem to be afraid of anything. They are not being careful with anything they're doing. They are just literally joking around. And of course, when you look at the photographs the way I have and you realize that it's just two guys playing in the mud with a wet flag, like Apollo 17, all of the videos are like that. They're doing that here. It's a full simulation shot on Earth. If your very life was depending on those spacesuits, you wouldn't be falling down on things and risking cutting or ripping your suit or tearing it or just the way they, they're horsing around in it. The hoses could be, become disconnected. Anything could happen. They could fall down and break their shield on their face, right? And crack it open in those kind of environments. And to start with, the spacesuit simply can't handle that kind of a vacuum or the seals or the material, anything. They would simply explode. It's very the, strange. And the, the lander mm -hmm. itself was 12 millimeter thickness of a skin to hold back the pressure inside the spacecraft is absolutely the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh, by the, yeah, way, the lunar module had mm -hmm. the equivalent thickness of uh, three layers of kitchen foil. How did the lunar rover dune buggy ever fit in the lunar module? Well, the rover was folded into quadrant one, which is the, if you're looking at the lander on the right hand side of the lander and the wheels folded up and the seats folded flat. The equipment rack on the back was sitting in quadrant three, as well as the battery packs and the other tools that they had for it. And it takes about an hour for them to bring the thing down and get everything assembled on it. That's not in the same timeline as what is being shown in the documents or the journal files for the Apollo missions. That particular rover weighs 462 pounds Earth weight and about 65 or 70 pounds on the moon if it had that. And then the batteries are 60 kilos apiece, the two batteries on it. There was damage to the rover in Apollo 15, and that is noted in the journal that the one bank, the one battery bank was down, so it only had half of the power for it to run around on. The steering was broken, and the seats were somewhat damaged, but they still managed to use it. It is not exactly what happened to it. They actually dropped that machine during the simulation of the landing. The exhaust bell housing broke off, the legs broke right off, they physically dropped it from a gantry. The strap broke, the hammer and feather dropped for Apollo 15. They're dropping the hammer and feather right beside the strap that has broken the very large gantry strap. And when you see the size of the thing, it probably handled at least 10 tons 
that particular strap and you look at the one eighth cable that the rover, which is the heaviest piece of equipment they had to handle, is on one little one eighth piece of cable that was holding it in place. But they do have multiple rovers and I have put videos up showing the various rovers that they're actually in Apollo 17. There's just a bunch of young guys out there riding around with three rovers. What are you going to First thing you do if you have more than one vehicle, you're going to race them. And that's exactly what they were doing with them. They were just horsing around with the different machines. They were hand-built machines. I have photos showing that the frame rails were completely different design on them, that the tires that were hand-built have different tracks. Even the, the Chevron track is a different width and spacing on them between the different uh, rovers that they were using. I also wanted to throw this one uh, to you, Randy. And as you know, since we are here in July, and that means NASA has been, at, they, they've been at it, posting up all sorts of different articles. And one of them has to do with a, an experiment that they left behind that continues to return fresh data to this day, they say. Yeah, that reminds me of the retro reflectors they've claimed to have left on the moon the yes. surface as well. Absolutely. Uh, uh, these experiments rather could easily be put there by unmanned missions. They had that capability. The Soviets had that capability 50 years ago. True. And so that for me is uh, not proof in any way that the Apollo missions happened. And that's just another fictional narrative to keep the fake legacy going. Yes, that doesn't mean very much to you then in terms of its validity. No, I mean, there may be experiments on the moon. I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying that they're not getting data. They, no, they I understand be, it, yeah. Yeah, I hear but you. didn't come from the Apollo moon missions. They they just they had to I would like to add one thing that Scott mentioned regarding yes. the lunar lander for, for your listener there. There's something that I want them, everybody listening here to factor this in. If, this, if these missions were real, even in the vacuum of space, you have to factor in weight and balance. And if you're going to add several hundred pounds or, you know, that rate 60 70 pounds in the vacuum of space you still have to take into account weight and balance considerations for the lunar module when it's landing on the moon and you also have to take into account that when you're using a propellant the center of thrust and the center of gravity is going to change for the weight and balance specifications of the lunar module and that can only be uh, take that can only be calculated on an ongoing basis by an autonomous computer which the apollo guidance computer in the lunar module was not capable of doing doing 